Right. So for the next part of the lecture, we're really going on with hydro, but instead of uh, fast flowing rivers or high reservoirs, the other thing that is actually uh, used for electricity generation is tidal schemes. And this is something that as long as you have a river and the river has a sufficient area and tidal range or height difference, then you can generate electricity. And it comes from the gravitational pull from the moon. So as the moon orbits the earth, wherever the moon is, um, there's a gravitational force that actually pulls the earth's surface and the earth's surface will change by a meter between uh, wherever the moon is and the point 90 um, degrees away. So as the moon goes around, you get the water particularly uh, being pulled and you get this change in the shape of the Earth. So the period for the moon orbiting the Earth is 12 and a half hours or, or about 12 and a half hours. The tidal range mid-ocean is only half a meter. But when you get a, a river or an estuary and particularly something that's a delta type shape or triangular type shape, you can get a sub substantial amplification of this half meter and you get useful heights to generate electricity of between three to 15 meters. Now I'll show you some, some examples uh, of places where uh, this is used. So just to show the, what the concept here is, you put a dam across um, an estuary or a tidal basin and at high tide, the outside will be at a much higher height and the water will flow through a turbine to the side with low tide uh, and generate electricity in that process. So typically you have to put a, a barrage or dam the whole way across a tidal basin or estuary um, and block off to the open sea. Now the, the power that is available from this, the average power, is the density of water. So that's just a thousand kilograms per cubic meter times the acceleration due to gravity. So 9.81 meters per second squared times the area. Well, this is the area of the tidal basin times the height, which is the difference between high tide and low tide that we have here. Uh, that squared divided by twice the period. Now the period is the time between the tides and that's 12 and a half hours. Now the point to note about this is that you can run this um, in both directions. So as the high tide moves to a low tide, the water flows through, this side will build up. And then as the tides change, the water will flow in the opposite direction. So there will be a point um, where no electricity can be generated but the heights are the same on both sides of the tidal uh, barrage. But throughout the rest of the day, you can generate electricity with a flow in both directions. So here's an example in France that was built in 1967 at La Ronge. So the original scheme was 24 turbines. Each turbine was rated at a maximum power of 10 megawatts. You can see that here's the barrage. The turbines run through um, underneath. There's a road built over the top. There's some bridges and there's also some locks so that you can still use uh, boats or allow boats to go up and down the river uh, because one of the issues is that the barrage or, or bridge will actually block off um, the ability to actually use the river. Now, in this case, the tidal height is 12 meters and the available head on either side of the, uh, the barrage is five meters. Now, in fact, here, um, silt has, has become quite an issue on this particular setup because it wasn't actually designed to make it easy to actually desilt and run maintenance on the turbines. So the turbines ran in two directions up to 1975 and from then on, they only ran in one direction. One of the key issues of this scheme was that the whole river was blocked when um, the dam was actually built. 
and a large part of the ecosystem on the river collapsed. So there was a lot of wildlife, uh, birds and fish were killed, and it took over 10 years before that ecosystem actually recovered. So once operational, the ecosystem returned to normal, um, but there hasn't really been long-term monitoring to see what goes on. So you can see the problems here if you don't actually think about the designs and the effects on fish, wildlife, and the local ecosystem. So in fact, in this Laurent scheme, what they were using is this um, type of bulb turbine. So there's a generator inside. The generator um, has water going on both sides. There's a turbine at the back and there's some blades, uh, distributors it's called, to get an, eco, an, an even flow pattern over the turbines. Now this is part of the problem with the uh, Blorange scheme in that it's, you have to actually block everything off and shut down the whole generation for a significant period of time to do any maintenance on the generator. What's much more popular with new schemes is to have this type of setup where you have a long shaft um, and a turbine that goes to gearbox and then generator that are outside of the water. That makes it much easier to do maintenance. And you also put in sluice gates that you can shut everything off, um, take all the water out of here and much more easily do maintenance onto the tur turbines um, themselves. So that's both to remove silt, but also any other um, rubbish that basically comes down the river. So the real problems at La Ronge was a lot of particular um, tree trunks, as well as um, branches and leaves that would come in and get blocked in the runners. There's other types as well, the strata flow or rim turbines. This is where you can get much higher uh, flow rates going through and they're set up to get 50 to 100 um, revolutions per minute. So I'm going to give you an example uh, with some of the numbers that you can see how much energy and power generation you could potentially do with um, these tidal schemes. So in the UK, there have been three attempts with planning permission to try and do what's known as the Severn Barrage um, tidal scheme. And this is basically between Wales and uh, Bristol is actually just a bit here. And the idea is to put some, uh, that's where the Severn Bridge is across the, the Severn uh, River. The idea is around here to build your dam or your barrage. And here the, here's the example. There's two different examples where to do it, a dam um, there and a further one uh, down. And the area that's available is 520 square kilometers. So it's pretty big when we start to put the area into this formula. The available head of water is seven meters which is quite substantial. So does, could anybody have a guess over how much power do you think might be available? So, you know, if we talk about a nuclear uh, generator or nuclear reactor being about a gigawatt, how many megawatts or gigawatts do you think this uh, scheme may be able to produce? Any guesses? 50. So 50 watt? Megawatt. 50 megawatts, okay. Thank you. Any other guesses? Higher, lower? 40, 40 megawatts. Okay, 40 megawatts. Anybody else want to make a guess? Okay, well, thanks for those guesses. We'll go through and we'll calculate what the numbers are. So we just use the formula with the average power, the density of water, so that's a thousand. We've got the gravitational acceleration, <coughs> so that's 9.81 meters per second squared. <coughs> the area, we need to put this into meters, so it's going to be 520 times 10 to the 3, all squared, times the height, so seven squared is 49 divided by 
twice the period, where the period is 12 and a half hours. So that's four and a half times 10 to the four seconds. So we can write those all in, put them into our calculator or do the mental arithmetic. And you get 2.8 gigawatts. So this is more than two nuclear reactors and it's almost three nuclear reactors in terms of the power generation that would come out of this scheme. So you can see this is actually quite substantial. And from the guesses, they're the typical guesses I get every year. Many students don't realize the amount of power and energy that's available from tidal, and as you'll see later from wave generation schemes as well. So this is equivalent power generation to more than two nuclear reactors. And that's substantial and it's very low carbon emitting. Now this hasn't happened. It's been turned down in planning permission three times. Well, the first one is that the cost to build it, so the upfront capital cost is actually enormous. Now long-term, because it will have lifetime well over a hundred years, that becomes eco um, economy. It, it becomes economic and the cost of energy and electricity provided you can run it for over 100 years, even with the maintenance, becomes comparable and very cheap to many other electricity generation schemes. The biggest reasons for turning it down in the UK have been environmental, that potentially if you don't design this correctly, it has issues with the wildlife or fish, birds, insects, and the whole ecological uh, chain in that particular area. So you can see here that despite the fact that the, uh, the environmental people want to have low carbon emitting and renewable energy forms. So this is a very sustainable form of energy, yet many of the environmental people are against it. So you know th this is one of the dichotomies you always see when you start to talk about green issues, sustainable energy and renewable energy. Frequently, it's actually the people demanding low carbon sources of energy are the first to actually be against renewable and sustainable energy sources. So the CO2 emissions from this are extremely low. Again, the majority are going to come from building the barrage, the dam, um, flooding issues. Uh, in, in the Severn case, there's very little, but again, the organic decay goes to methane that's three times worse to the environment than carbon dioxide. And it's fairly easy to build locks to allow shipping to pass, to still allow rivers to be live rivers in terms of uh, shipping economy. Now we have a phrase in the UK called NIMBY, and this is a, an acronym for not in my backyard. So the, the problem I'm talking about here with the environmental community who want green forms of electricity and low carbon generating electricity, they seem to be against whether it's wind, whether it's hydro, when it's in their local environment. And so we've got this phrase now called not in my backyard. They're very happy if wind turbines are built elsewhere. They want everybody to use wind turbines, but they don't want a wind turbine near where they live. And this has been an enormous problem in the UK with planning, trying to get uh, wind turbines and some tidal schemes like the, the Severn to be built. Okay, so now something a little bit different again. We're going to look at waves on water. And you're probably aware this, this is not something that you get all the time. It's a little bit like wind and in fact it's the size of the waves is heavily dependent on the wind. But what we're going to do is go through and derive how much energy and power is available from water waves. So what we're talking about here is that if we take a fixed point in the water in terms of X, a wave is going to go up and down. So if we're going to put something here, it will basically go up and down as the wave flows through from the peak to the trough. And that motion going up and down 
<clears throat> we've got potential energy converting to maximum kinetic energy uh, at z equals zero here, and then back to potential energy at the bottom. And so that's something, if we can design a mechanical feature here, we can potentially extract and use. So the parameters here I'm going to use, we've got potential energy, and I want mass times gravitational acceleration times height. The height, well, we're going to call it Z. And we're going to do this in differential form because we want to use a sine wave for the, the water wave. So this wave that we've got here, the amp maximum amplitude is A, and it's sine 2 pi x over lambda, where lambda is the wavelength. So here's plus a half lambda, here's minus a half lambda. We've set the origin at zero, <clears throat> and so it's a sine wave. You can also derive this with a cosine. You just set the origin to the maximum point that you have. <clears throat> so what we have is mass. Well, we've written this in terms of density. Um, we've got the gravitational acceleration, and we've got the distance. Well, we've called plus z here, so we need a two in because we've got above zero and below zero as well. So the first bit we're going to do is do the integral between zero going up to a sine two pi x over lambda. So you see if we'd done minus a sine two pi x over lambda, then there wouldn't be a two in the front, but because we've done this from zero to that value, there's a two at the front. So if we just integrate uh, z, then um, of course we're going to get z squared or a half z squared coming in. So the, the two cancels out at the front. We then, when we put in zero, that's just gonna give a zero. So we substitute in a sine two pi x lambda, um, that's squared. So we end up with sine squared two pi x over lambda and rho g, well, we've got the a coming out the front, um, or we, sorry, we've got a squared that comes out the front here. We then want to integrate this. And so the trick to note is that the integral of uh, sine, sine squared ax is x over two minus a quarter sine two x. So there's a standard integral that is just sine squared ax equals x over two minus a quarter sine two x. Um, so sine squared x is a half one minus cos two x. So that's just using a, a fairly standard trigonometric identity. We can then solve what we have here. So when we do that, and then we substitute in a half lambda, we end up with a quarter, uh, the density, times the gravitational acceleration, times the amplitude squared, times the wavelength. Now the trick we're now going to do here is that this particular problem, we've got maximum potential energy, maximum potential energy, maximum kinetic energy. So it, it's a typical second order differential equation, wave equation. Um, so we can use equipartition of energy and the potential energy equals the kinetic energy. So the total energy is potential energy plus kinetic energy. These are equal. So we end up with just twice our solution here for the total energy in the system. So our total energy is a half, so just twice a quarter. We get a half um, the density times the gravitational acceleration times the amplitude squared times the wavelength. And this is over a whole wavelength. Or the way this is frequently written is it's the energy per unit length and per unit width is a half density times gravitational acceleration times the amplitude squared of the wave. Well, let's show you a bit more in, in some real examples now so you can get a better idea of how much energy is available. So in terms of wave energy, here's an example. There's gonna be some depth, there's a particular wavelength, there's the wave height, so this is our amplitude A, and we've got a velocity. Now the velocity is given by this formula of the square root of the gravitational acceleration times the wavelength divided by two pi. So it's easy to measure the wavelength, it's much more difficult to measure the velocity. Now, power 
in fact, is the energy times the group velocity. Now, the group velocity doesn't equal the straight velocity we have of the water molecules in here. And the group velocity is actually given by a half of this velocity of, of the water molecules through the system. So it's a half times the square root of the gravitational acceleration times the wavelength divided by 2 pi. So overall, the power that we've got, if we just multiply this up and then substitute in this equation, we're going to get power. Well, we take this and put this in. Um, ends up being a quarter times rho times the gravitational acceleration times the amplitude of the wave squared times the square root of gravitational acceleration times the wavelength divided by 2 pi. So this is the equation that tells us how much power we can generate per unit width of uh, the wave running along here. So how do we extract the energy? Well, in Scotland, uh, the University of Edinburgh in the 1970s, Professor Salter came up with an idea of what was nicknamed the Salter duck. So you make a spindle that's fixed to concrete moorings. And around that spindle, you have this, um, this mechanical feature that has buoyancy tanks that can move up and down in the water. And as the incident wave comes in, this basically goes up and down, absorbs the energy, and you have turbines that are connected to the end of this that can take the energy out and go into a Faraday generator to generate electricity. So how much electricity is actually available in all this? Well, let's take a, a typical number for the Atlantic Ocean on the west coast of Scotland. So we've got a density of water of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Let's put in an amplitude of one. So this is not a big storm and it's not flat cam, but actually this is a relatively small uh, number for the Atlantic Ocean. And you can look up and, and work out <clears throat> and a typical group velocity that you get is about 16 meters per second. Now, we take our formula we've derived for the power, and let's just put some of the numbers in. So here we put in our quarter, we put in the density of 1,000, acceleration of 9.81 meters per second squared, our amplitude is just one, and well actually what we've done is um, the group velocity here um, is just this, this equation here. So we end up with 39.2 kilowatts per meter. So the width of this, for every meter we've got, the maximum power that's available to extract is nearly 40 kilowatts for every meter width. Now, if we look at the Atlantic Ocean and you know, we ignore the Irish coast and just look at Scotland and um, the southeast sorry, the southwest of England, there's over a thousand kilometers of coastline available from the Atlantic. So if you just scale this, you actually have about 40 gigawatts of available electricity generation. That's 34 nuclear reactors. And at the moment, the UK installed gener uh, electricity generation total capacity is 80 gigawatts. So this is already half what the UK uh, generates in electricity. Now, in the UK, we have nothing being generated from waves. So you can see perhaps this is an enormous resource in terms of available power, but in fact, there are many real problems with these systems. And the biggest problem um, is that this is a mechanical system. The amount of energy, particularly when you get a storm, is enormous. And so the real problem with the Salter ducks and testing was that they never managed to survive any storm. Now you might think, okay, well, why don't we just produce something we can take out the water um, if there's a storm coming? 
Well, that actually increases the cost so much that then uh, you can't afford to generate electricity with these particular uh, salter ducts. So there's an enormous amount of energy available in the ocean from waterways. The real problem is how do you build a system that can easily remove that and also is robust to the amount of energy that's out here and the differences that it goes between from the CAM all the way to major storms. Now, in fact, when, when I started this course, there were a number of companies in the UK had uh, funding from the government to actually try and look at new ways of collecting wave energy that they claimed originally would have um, much better efficiency at extracting that energy out of the water, but also would be able to actually um, survive when you get very large uh, storms coming through. Now, this is a company called Pelmis. They claimed they could get 750 kilowatt per 180 meter section. Um, the idea was to have something um, a little bit like a snake with sections that were decoupled and can move up and down. And then mechanically between these sections, you can end up um, recovering the, the kinetic energy and turning that into electricity. Well, the company went bankrupt four years ago. So it, it ran for about five years and basically the results were so poor that no investor was prepared to invest in this technology. So they never managed to actually demonstrate what the real cost of electricity generation would be or what average power they could actually deliver out of this system. So that's a good point to break again. So let me just stop the recording.